The first tap of a conductor's wand. The first ribbon in a mile high tower. The master link at the genesis of the never ending chain. The moment a single empty canvas meets a singular master stroke. There is no one thing. Because now, there are many. Because soon, there will be more. Because one is ever the beginning. Like the first link in an infinite chain, or the first rivet in the tallest skyscraper. The master stroke is found in the masterpiece. What will you begin? Hello world, and welcome to the 50th episode of the World Blockchain Roundtable. Our hosts for today are Greg from Rivet, myself, Dave from Den Social, and potentially Satoshi Shan, the entrepreneur and everyone's friend that drops in on us um, almost every week, so he might drop in a little bit later during the show. I want to give a quick update. I'm, I'm going to be leading uh, this week. Joe is busy with important things, which is awesome. I love it when he's in, busy with important things. So um, let me give you some updates. The uh, WBRT layer ownership tokens distribution from last week's episode, um, each host from last week will receive 166 lot. Each topic contributor from last week will receive 55 lot. And this uh, theme was suggested by Jacob Wayne, who will uh, receive 55 lot. Uh, these ownerships tokens, as a reminder, they come with perpetual passive income free edits and uh, governance votes. So you can direct uh, this show, you can own this show, you can profit from this show, depending on how well it does and how much you are involved and all of that stuff. So you pick our topics and we talk about them. Um, Greg, how are you doing? You want to talk about current events a little bit and get yeah, calibrated sure. here? What's uh, going on? So happy Cinco de Mayo, happy belated uh, May the 4th. Um, yeah, I felt, yeah, I felt yeah. a great disturbance in the fourth, and it was because we weren't on that day, so I couldn't make as many Star Wars puns. <laughs> I had the coffee show yesterday, so it happened to land on May the fourth. So I just did the May the fourth edition, and we talked about our favorite and our worst, or least favorite Star Wars films and things like that. Ooh. So I think that we should, you know, since we have uh, you know all these other people waiting to talk, um, maybe start there and then lead into current events. What's your favorite Star Wars? Oh, yeah, sure, man. My favorite. So it depends on how you're asking, because there's a whole lot of Star Wars stuff. There's, you know, I, I haven't actually seen, for example, the animated series, which I've heard is some of the best seen content that's ever been written. Um, so I, I do want to I want that caveat there. I don't haven't seen everything. But um, you're talking about the animated Clone Wars, right? I think so. Uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, but again, I haven't seen it. So I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm vaguely sure that that's the one. I haven't seen any animated stuff. I haven't played any of the Lego Star Wars. You know what I mean? But I've been watching Star Wars for a lot of years. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the the uh, TV miniseries they did uh, with that uh, weird Ewok tale? Mm. The crash landed mm -hmm. ship. Mm -hmm. Who crash landed? I, um, I don't remember that my, that many details about it because oh. I think it was sort of at the ending of its run about the time I was halfway into consciousness and commercials were way more catchy so i i could recite the jingles but um uh, but not so much the the names of the characters in the films that's what sticks uh, with you you know what i mean yeah right. i did finally get around to watching the christmas special which was a lot of fun <laughs> depending on what your idea of fun is you know what i mean oh right um, um, but yeah on the point my favorite everybody's a little bit masochist we were talking and thinking about it and tearing them apart yesterday, so it was easy to say, you know what? Good point. That's my favorite. But I think it was Empire. I'm a big fan of the uh, Hoth battle. Um, I love the uh, whatever they were, the land speeders or whatever they use with the uh, the grappling the the the, the harpoon, right? Mm -hmm. They wrapped around the AT-AT's legs and tripped it up and made it fall. When I was a kid, that was the coolest shit I'd ever seen, man. And oh, yeah. I, it stayed with me that that battle of Hoth has stayed with me and then the whole Dagobah system and traveling to uh meet Yoda and all that stuff mm. so Empire Strikes Back um was mine the other two guys both chose Return of the Jedi as their favorite I think 
Gotcha. I can't even pick you? one because um, I have to categorize my favorites. Like, so I have a favorite for which one had the coolest ships, or my favorite for which one had, oh, that's you good. know, like the the least amount of uh, Wilhelm screams. And you know, like, so technically, if I had to pick one, I'm not a big fan of the Wilhelm screams. So it's whichever one has the least of those is, is the one I'd probably it have to give the absolute. You talking about that? Oh, you, you know the Wilhelm scream. You just don't I probably know do. That. I just don't know that it referred to as such. That um, ow! It shows up in every action flick. Oh, I don't know. I'll have to think about oh, it. Oh, my God. Okay, we, we actually we have an extra browser window and room on the screen. We were going to well, play, it. It play the audio anyway. Um, oh, it, it doesn't? <laughs> um, what is your – you have to pick one, though. You can't say I can't. This, that's the whole Okay, that's my the favorite show. is hmm, <laughs> probably the what? original Star Wars. Episode yeah. four. Episode four. Because, yeah. Oh, you know what? That was with somebody yesterday. It was Return of the Jedi and then A New Hope was somebody else's favorite. I remember because the now. two suns oh. setting blew my mind the first time I saw it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I was Later. terrified of Star Wars because I was sort of a newborn baby when Jedi came out. My parents took me anyway. So, you know, <laughs> um, deep early gut reaction anti uh, forest speeder, even though I want one now. I was mm. not into it as a kid. The forest feeders uh, were. I, I loved how they uh, did that. Actually, yeah. For oh, some yeah. reason, I just loved seeing them crash into the big trees. I don't yep. know if that's related to watching NASCAR as a child and mm -hmm. thinking the wrecks were cool. I don't know. Right, <laughs> <laughs> it's the best part. Yeah, um, I um, my losing actually too, and basically just because I just I can't. The same thing with you probably with the certain style of scream or yell or whatever. Um, Anakin just being such a teenager annoyed the hell out of me oh, you know he's yeah. whiny and pouty and mopey and meh, the whole movie and i'm oh, like and dude anakin and vader why are you doing this in episode two right now i don't right. like and it. how did he go from such a positive little kid yeah yeah, yeah. No, like, well i mean there's reasons i guess i mean you had to i think they they had to shove him into the vader suit way too fast mm. uh, they they fit those to the story that they didn't intend to tell hmm I don't know. There's 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 a lot more to the Vader thing too, like the details of what it's like to be Vader. You know. Yeah. I've oh, yeah. read some of the. Um, Did you, you know, read like, the books? No, no, no. But I've read some of them. I, I know a guy who reads all the books, and he's told me about this. He's got tattoos and stuff of all the Star Wars things. But he was talking about how excruciating it is to be Vader and live in right. that suit. Things like and that. what's more is he's using the dark side of the Force to try to be able to ultimately live without the helmet. That's what he's doing in the bubble. Mm. Yeah empire when that comes up he puts his helmet back on he's sitting there trying to maintain hatred uh without his uh painful helmet suit on and oh, the problem weird. is as soon as he takes it off and he starts using the force to breathe normally he cheers up and can't maintain sufficient anger to use the dark side to keep the helmet off oh, is that just canon? like that's a the form book. of self-torture rather in this expanded universe that's that's what's written about uh that was actually in the novelization that lucas wrote Oh, of the original. No kidding. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I didn't. I knew there was something to do with like, you know, Vader having more to do. There's There was more going on with him than just he's an evil asshole with a bunch of powers, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Now, I like as far as that, badass lightsabers, you have oh, to give yeah. it episode one, right? Because of Darth Maul. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was that was Ooh, the wait, first. Actually, you know, Kylo Ren might have a better saber such a better like i love that saber better than um like kylo ren saber for example with the cracked I love that thing. kyber crystal thing i um, love that thing isn't that what it was it was an imperfect kyber crystal that he had to vent out of the sides to make i it think that might have been how they justified it but technically it was mostly a joni ive design that they foisted into the store so it could be like a claymore uh, it's the most it. iphone lightsaber ever invented <laughs> Uh, I'm okay with the justification after the fact, though. You know, yeah. as long as you can justify it and fix it, that's fine. That's now, fine. what weapon do you think they tried and failed at? Because they got the pole arm, you know, and they were like, okay, we need something with a pommel guard because that's new. You know what does exist that I haven't seen in the films is a whip, a lightsaber whip. Yep. Or like a meteor hammer, like from uh, uh, Kill Bill Volume 1. Which one was that? I know, I know that Kill is Bill. The, uh, that is the. Yeah. Uh, crazy 88's lieutenant who drops the ball on the floor and spikes turn out of it. Oh, it's been so since it came out since I've seen that, I think. I don't think uh, I ever saw episode the next one, volume two. Uh, um, and I'm being partial. I have full disclosure. My D&D &D character uses a meteor hammer 
modeled. Oh, okay. So you're familiar. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean that, and it's sort of like a mix between that and Simon Belmont's Morningstar, because I've got a Trevor Bel Belmont character model. But all right, anyway, I'm a nerd, and I'm proud. Uh, did we do least favorite? What's your least favorite? Least you just favorite. Said, right? You say least favorite yet? Least favorite so. would probably be. That's you know I I will demur on least favorite because I I like all of the bottom half about the same and I mm -hmm. I too much of a sci-fi buff to turn down you gotcha. know, poorly told but beautifully rendered sci-fi you know, yeah like, yeah even even the one enough that there are star destroyers that show up and yeah. that there mm -hmm. are lasers going off like that's I'm I'm a an easy customer when it comes to sci-fi I'll watch anything. Yeah, the um, something you and I are both fans of the No Man's Sky video game. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, for whatever reason, I made this connection with Star Wars in my head where Star Wars is a trilogy of trilogies, right? And the themes in Star Wars keep uh, repeating themselves. And if they don't repeat, they rhyme, mm -hmm. right? They're similar enough to where, you know, you have Leia and Rhea and <laughs> you have like um, certain situations that happen that are like analogs of the other trilogy, uh, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And 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 because I I think I might I must have been recently playing that game or something. I was like, you know, No Man's Sky does that. Everything's like the same, but not. Right. <laughs> so it's oh, kind yeah. of theme at this point with Star Wars. And with after the new update, it's even more, uh, you know, not quite the samey samey. There are, there are a yeah. lot more flavors of ice cream now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which also sort of reminds me of like Battlestar Galactica's. All of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. Kind mm -hmm. of. Well, that seems to be the story arc that people get back to when they run out of ideas to end a story. Yeah, this where they don't want to end the story because they're like, you know, we might want to do another sequel because we might get an idea for a way to extend this. It's kind of like people copying NFT projects and some to some extent. Hey, right. that worked. Let's do that. Change the skin right. names and the stories, and then yeah, right, exactly. Or like, okay, we're going to go back and find you know technically what Tolkien wrote as the prototypical version of the Aragorn story and pull in Morgoth, which was really more of a, you know, well, actually more on early days of Sauron, end of Morgoth era, right? Just a prototype of the third era story. You know, like Tolkien wrote it in cycles too. It's, I think it's a human way of thinking. We've got a, um, I've read, I've read the books and I've seen the films uh, and we have a layer on Den uh, dedicated to Tolkien and someone, I forget who they are. They have been posting daily, um, like today's April 5th or whatever. And then this happened, uh, mm -hmm. Gandalf meets Bilbo and yada, yada, yada. And it's cool because this is, I, I imagine it's from a desk calendar or something, but yeah. it actually does follow the story, the books. So like over the course of a year, you get little like, uh, okay. And then the next thing happens and then the next thing happens. So you actually remember the story every, oh yeah, now we're at this part every time. I thought that was kind of cool. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. and uh, I'm not going to do it now because I think that I'm going to insist upon a governance vote that passes to to do it on the air. But afterwards, I will do my really awesome Smeagol impersonation for you. Heck yeah. <laughs> now, if anybody wants to pass a governance vote, I will adhere to the vote. So, you know, please maybe don't make me do it for the whole show, but I will if you if you make me. Just just put put you in that in that character mode the entire show. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. What else is going on in the world this week yeah. there, Greg? We've got a lot, I think, man. This week is full of a lot of stuff, I guess. It's been uh, a roller coaster the last few days. I'm not sure, I like, you know, what do you want to even get into talking to and where do you start? Well, you know, I think the first thing we have to say about all of the first major t major subject, because I'm sure that right now everybody's going like, I wonder if they're going to go there. Um, and there means the same thing to you that it does to me, that it means to anybody who hears that right now that is in, you know, involved in the Western parts of the internet, which is sort of most of it still, right? Um, even if you don't know anything about the the weirdness around the culture wars and abortion because you haven't lived here, you know, or you're not a woman, so you don't have any idea. Um, this is, this is you know, like what it actually feels like to have a baby. That's um, what I was talking about earlier, you know, before we started the show is I was talking to my wife about this um, yesterday. And, you know, to an extent, I've got to defer to the person with a uterus who has more experience in these things and knows about it. But you're oh, right. Yeah. It has been a long and storied 
story in the uh, in, right. in the U.S. And there's a lot of stuff that touches on a lot of other stuff that we care a lot about. So, you know, I think the first thing we have to do, um, and the first my first impulse, whole show or no show? Ooh, sorry, I had to pump that in there from Joe since uh, we were talking about it. Do it big or don't do it at all. He says. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Yep. Okay. If the only way I will do it then, because I like Joe's suggestion, is if a governance issue passes, to insist I do it for a whole show. <laughs> okay. And and um, I will leave it to the hosts uh, to decide which one it is, and they can spring it on me. Okay. All right. Noted. Noted. Sorry to derail you. Um, no, it's. I you were it's talking funny. about something important. <laughs> I, yeah. I put a joke in in the middle of it, which was not tasteful. Sorry. Fair enough. No, it's it's <laughs> totally tasteful because the way that we, you know, the the way that we deal with the discomfort of it, even right, like it's hard for me to sit here and think about, um, you know, even saying any particular thing on this because I have no idea who the hell I'm going to offend anymore, right? And and it's not that I don't care who I offend. Um, it's it's quite the opposite. I actually care a great deal about offending people I didn't intend to. You know, if I if I intend to hurt somebody's feelings, um, you know, it's a pretty weird day for me. You know, I'm, I'm really more just trying to have a conversation. So I think we should all come into it with some charitability. You know, and I think that's something that we all need to do, especially the side of us. Like, I don't think that it was any super big secret that I wasn't a big fan of uh, facial apparel mandates or um, uh, particular requirements around. Uh, you know, what medical treatments you had to accept without doing a self-risk evaluation. You know, you know, that, that was something that I felt was a violation of my bodily autonomy, mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, an, it's a minor thing compared to having a thing grow in you. You know, like, even if it's not a kid, like, uh, but, but a human child growing in you is a big deal. And I don't think that there's enough consensus on this ever. You know, like, it's one of those things where the it feels to me like it's just a majority of one and we have a lot of single uh uh single individual states set up around that one because everybody's going to hit a little different with it yeah there's um i don't want to suggest that these are uh apples to apples comparison but i have oh, yeah no <clears throat> i have seen something that i think is very interesting that i haven't seen a lot of people talk about yet or maybe i'm just not talking to the right people or enough people but you know we were talking a minute ago about history rhyming or repeating or you know similar uh structures existing and and on um, yeah you know, this one's unprecedented in a way though we had a little um, bit with the the way that the left is talking about what the right's doing and the way the right's talking about what the left is doing mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's as if we have the same complaints about the same people, but on right. different topics that, right. and, that are more important to one side or the other, but really you're both saying, Hey, both of us see reasons of, okay, you know what? I'm going to tell you about your people. Here's the reason they're all screwed up. And then the other side's like, yeah, well, let me tell you about your people. Here's the reason they're all yeah. screwed up. And well, the new flavor of it, right? Is is kiss. You, you know, like we should get along with each other and say, I hate everything about your lifestyle, but I know that you're not doing it. They're right. It. And so moreover, we know what happens you when you that. try to govern not by consensus on culture issues, right? If we don't have consensus, we should recognize very quickly that it's not something that anybody who can squeak out a bare majority or even a, we should we should basically take advantage of this in the short term and make it a focus because all the other stuff. You know, probably they don't even have any idea how to address and they're terrified of it. They need this anyway because it's like the only thing that can rile up the people that voted for them last time. Um, yeah. it, it's 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 very cynical to me. I don't I think they know exactly what they're doing with this. See, you that's know, like kind of what I'm thinking too is yeah, I know we don't need people with guns enforcing things that the half the nation has a different opinion on from the other. Yeah, they'll enforce it on themselves. They'll that's what I'm saying. The, the the divide and conquer thing, I know it's such a like tired trope, but it's such a true thing that happens over and over again. Yeah. And yeah. and I do see it's almost as if it's like here's the same shaped anger and outrage, but in different mm -hmm. contexts. Let's apply it to both sides and let them fight amongst themselves. Well, and the weird thing about this is it's tempting to go down that hole, right? It's tempting to pay away and have that conversation. Um, but we actually do need to step back and look at what the hell just happened with the court because there are a lot of people with a lot of confusion over that. 
Um, so, even yeah. people who know, like, don't really have a clear view because, I mean, I'm sure everybody has probably more likely heard law enforcement practices and methods, right? Mm -hmm. Or intelligence practices and methods, or this document is classified for national security. Those types of things. That's what that's that's the that's executive what secrets. That's, that's the story we read about what right. executive secrets, right. legislative secrets. You can make a couple hypothetical arguments that sound like it's justified in maybe one edge case, and uh, the executive uses it pretty aggressively, and so does the legislature. But with the courts, they've never had a breach of this kind really before. So explain what and, you're more of a legal background than I am. Can you explain a little bit, not not exactly, but just a decent broad stroke on what it is that just happened with the lead, yeah. the that kind of thing? Yeah. And and it bears a little background because everybody knows a judge or a justice probably, um, but there are only nine Supreme Court justices, and their job is especially unique. Um, normal justices, normal judges at a local level, maybe even have to face an election. They go to mm -hmm. lobbying events. They deal with a lot of mundane, everyday things that just happen a lot. You know, like people need uh, their uh, parking ticket to be adjudicated. And <laughs> there are thousands of cars uh, in a square block in most major cities. And people don't fucking pay those meters very frequently. So there's like a guy whose job it is to organize that judge that for that one half block. You know, they share with 10 other judges and they go through these, these motions and these court procedures that pretty much stay the same as you go up the the uh, process to more complicated, more contentious matters, right? But then you get to this weird spot where there's a trial, right? A trial court judge uh, after the trial may or may not uh, be embarrassed later by the, the appeal by a right, where we start finally talking to justices. And all those guys do is listen to lawyers argue and write about it. And whether or not those things get published is really what makes the law after um, after we get past the trial court phase. And so when you say justices, you're talking about the difference between anybody at the appeals court level or above. Okay. Got you. Right. So you have an appeal. What ultimately happens is they write an opinion. If that opinion is, is sort of publication worthy, you know, if it's not just like somebody appealed by right on their, uh, nonviolent drug offense and they didn't even go to prison. They just don't want it on the record. Mm -hmm. Thousands of those happen, right? Those aren't published. Okay. But when you get something like, you know, attacking a major constitutional uh, uh, item, you know, and I, I don't want to get too precise here because there's some really fine nuances that the the uh, Alito leaked opinion, which clearly needs some editing at a minimum, and I'm being charitable, right? Um, that thing took a very ugly broadside approach to undermining the thing that it it had three or four less broad justifications to try that, that he probably would have had a better time getting the rest of the court to agree with. Yeah. And this is, um, this is something that this is not exactly what you're talking about, but this is the right. Wade, the Wade thing has been, um, there's been precedent too. Since right. And I've read the opinion, but again, we need to take a meta step back again, because okay. everybody freaked out about that leak thinking, Holy shit, this has to be the opinion they're running with. Uh, are you saying that it's more about the deliberation? I'm saying no. that, yeah, I'm saying this and I'll, I'll actually, I'll cut the, cut the chase. And if we need to go into more detail, we can, but like their statement, if you read it, I, I guess this is the only thing we probably really do need to read. Uh, let's see this statement. Was this a statement that was put out after the fact? What do you mean a statement? Are they actually, they actually issued uh, one of their rare, uh, publications on the matter. They, they had a PR oh, okay. release over it. See, I haven't read that. I need to. And this this is where you actually get the people pontificating about what's really going on um, that I think are mostly getting it wrong because they're trying to create more controversy still. The real controversy is one we should definitely talk about, but it's not something to do with a specific law. And is that the bre breach of procedure, breach of process, that kind of thing? Is that what you're Check getting? This, out. this is exactly what they said. If I can find it. zero hedge, you know, where did you move this? Um, if you can, if you can beat me to it, you can read it first if you want. Um, no, I probably won't. <laughs> I wasn't okay, hang tight. Yet. This is what, and I, I know this has taken a minute, and it's not 
uh, not super flowy with the show, but it, it's really important to read the exact thing they wrote. I do like going to sources. That's something that I see a lot is um, taking something that is either printed or published on your screen in front of you that says things that you don't like, and then you run with them and you make your own assumptions. And then you, like, I'm not trying to at all say that people shouldn't be pissed off about um, about about the potential move that the courts are taking there. I'm just saying that like, you should definitely, Okay. A lot of people are helping their case when they don't understand what it is they're talking about and they still want to argue it, I guess. I think it hurts their case. It hurts their side. So yep. I wish people would read more about what's actually fundamentally going on, like what you're saying. So did you find right. it? I did. And I actually one up to myself. Uh, I hadn't even looked this up yet. And this was the first hit on DuckDuckGo. So this is nice. Uh, we are going to look at the actual press release they made. Okay. All right. So, so let's do that. Bring it up and then we'll, uh, we'll put yeah, it on the screen. So I just hit share. It should be showing up, or the screen should be showing up now anyway. Nope, didn't come up. Hmm. Okay, be wrong. We can skip that um, and have a note that, uh, you know, the, read, go yeah. to the Okay, I'll just, you know what, I'm just going to yeah. read the thing. So it starts off with the, the PR person for the court, Patricia McCabe, saying, okay, um, well, public information, uh, not not relations so much, but. Uh, yesterday, a news organization published a copy of a draft, uh, a draft opinion in a pending case. Here's the important line. Justices circulate draft opinions internally as a routine and essential part of the court's confidential deliberative work. Notice the and okay. there, routine and essential. Both of the courts don't use and idly. This is both a routine and essential practice. Okay. How many, now think about how many cases they take maybe one term. They deny most of them. They take like, you know, what mm -hmm. seems like an unreasonably small number. Mm -hmm. It does seem small. Sure. Well, what if their process is really this? And we don't know because the court was pretty much just mostly pissed about the leaker exposing this process because, you know, lawyers, you give us an inch, we'll find a way to game it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's about impartiality. Uh, for them to keep it confidential. But okay. imagine how many cases you could handle if your process was everybody go write a draft and now we're going to talk about them. Like we, we, we saw one of nine draft opinions that would ultimate, ultimately yeah. later become uh, the top one or the top two mashed together or maybe the top three mashed together. So this is what, and I'm, I'm uneducated in this process. So this is what I'm beginning to suspect you're getting at is mm -hmm. that there's, everybody writes, um, like what I would write as a shitty first draft on something just to get something down so we can tear it apart and see what's real. Well, I suspect he's had this draft for a while. And they talk about it and they pick each other apart. Is that what they do? Well, it, my, my point is more that I suspect he's had this draft for a long time. Like he probably started writing this his first year in the hopes that he'd have a reason to title it with the right case name and push for it. He's probably argued for it several times and enhanced it every time, you know? Okay. Um, I mean, you can even look at the appendices. It, it does a catalog of the state law around abortion as if he's creating a handy guideline of his opinions adopted in full uh, for the states to go back and look at either what laws they have to pass or what what uh, common law they have to accept. You know, um, a lot of it will be pretty scary because people will be passing laws like, no, we're not going to stone people, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, um, where, that's And that's if we can move into a small... Related Real fast, and then, move, just, and then and then move into the to the topic. I just wanted to say that what what you just hit on there was like <clears throat> where a lot of people are pissed off right now is mm -hmm. because they thought, and, and this is just what I'm hearing um, from some people, not everybody, blanket statement, but they thought they knew where we stood as a nation on this issue because you know it had been seen by the court already, it had been upheld, and you know again later mm -hmm. there was like two different added precedents to it. You know, and then now all of a sudden everyone's like, well, shit, we built our whole life here because we thought, you know, like people that you know, my wife moved here to Germany. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I think that if you had the level of criticism at Roe, um, it is overwrought and narrowly tailored to abortion specifically in a way that attempts to avoid creating a jurisprudential background that um, does things like outlaw the Patriot Act or undo the bank secrecy legislation because so, it's ultimately yeah, you, the origin of our right to privacy. And that's why it's so important, you know, uh, to all of us. 
even if you don't care about any women in your life, even your mom, <clears throat> um, and uh, or, or you believe that it's in women's best interest to be forced into a situation that you feel you have a right to impose upon them. Like, I disagree with that, but you know, some people feel that way strongly and it's based in beliefs that they hold genuinely, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we, we can't, we can't point guns at it and make it go away, but we also need to look at this and go, why did this come out? What happened yesterday that this was a useful distraction from, because Politico should have called the court before they published this. I mean, yeah. you can probably find 50 articles of them lambasting Snowden and lambasting Assange for not properly curating the damage that their leaks would do. They literally yeah, talked about for a uh, year. Critical and, and pick and choose what they publish. Yeah, that's that's, that's right. They, they've made hypocrites yeah, themselves like on every that's misinformation right. argument they've ever made. The what argument? Misinformation argument they've ever made. Oh, they've made hip hypocrites of themselves. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, on one hand, caused riots, and I don't think this is going to actually be the outcome. I think what we just heard from the court was they're not even going to think about overturning it. Okay, I don't think that. I don't think that this is the outcome either. A lot of people are under the impression that this is the outcome. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll hit one real quick on something I said earlier, just because I wanted to give an example. But um, you know, with 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 both ends of this sort of uh, having their own take on why it's good or bad or whatever, and different issues too. I was talking to someone yesterday who was, this was on like Facebook or whatever, and she was saying the same thing that a year ago I was hearing from uh, people that she was raving against, which is that it's about control, right? And she's talking about, you know, um, in the context of the Roe v. Wade potential decision, she was saying it's about control. They want to keep you barefoot and pregnant so that the yada, 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 and that kind of thing. And right. I and then I was just like, this is, you know, I know it's completely different and it's not apples to apples, but you, you realize this is what, this is what your political opponents were, were just saying about you. You both had the same yeah. arguments. It's, it's about control. It's about this, like maybe some are right and some are wrong, but everybody's got the same sort of right. problem with what's being handed down from on high, you know? Right. And calling back to Star Wars here, how many times can we play the same three damn movies in a row before, <laughs> before we get tired of losing uh, as a society because we're so hell bent on beating each other. You know, like it's obvious that what we're doing, even though we disagree genuinely right now is making things worse you know, and, and more God knows what they were actually doing. Like that could have been a, a clerk of the court who was a you know, basically a chaos creator because mm -hmm. the only way you could do that uh, and want to do it. Well, you have to know like, is like, I'm going to start some riots. Yay. Right. You know, like, yeah, it, there's something misanthropic about it that I don't like. Yeah, it's as if somebody's, uh, you know, the puppet master or whatever is like, I'm going to kick this hornet's nest and see what happens. Right. And, and to be clear, I'm not arguing that they should be censured or censored for it. Uh, the information is out there and the answer is counter speech still. But, but what happened to us that day? The, the FOMC spoke later that, you know, they were, they were doing all the analysis for the, uh, the actual biggest economic problem we have right now all that happened basically in the dark under this yeah i've, um, seen, I've seen some like i mean it's popped up on youtube and stuff oh, seen it. biden biden met with the chief shareholder of uh one of twitter's former major shareholders in a very secretive meeting uh he flew over to saudi arabia and had a chat with the prince whose uh, corporation no longer owns twitter uh twitter shares yeah yeah well you know we're done with top the current events topic but Right. Like so, what is really going on requires us to have, to have calm and, and open discussions, I guess. Well, probably, like, I'm trying to hope, to hope to spread to the audience and say like, look, don't assume the worst uh, and be charitable because this isn't, this is already sort of starting to create a self-distorting cycle. This is a really good segue into the topic actually, because I think that there probably is a very good, this is a very, uh, what am I trying to say? There's a lot of reasons for leaders of nations to meet with each other and talk in secret right now, right? I'm not yeah. saying a lot of more right. justified reasons. Maybe there are, maybe there aren't, but it seems well, like, you know. Um, under current law, they get to justify themselves and we have to take it. So um, is with, it justified? We can speculate, but we don't know. Yeah. And so with our topic today being um, history of cryptography, blockchain, and metaverse and pop culture, you yeah. do see something. Um, really uh it's almost it's almost like um 
you know how people say that <laughs> that uh, uh, idiocracy became a documentary. You know, it wasn't meant to be, but it became one. Well, yeah. you see, you see these, um, you know, William Gibson's and and Stephen Nielsen's and um, you know these uh, older books that predicted today, and part mm. of that, especially like um, you know Snow Crash, which has been brought up in the in the in the in the replies already, you know, sort of paint the picture of these, um, you know, what we what we talk about today, which is that we have a corporate controlled government. It's just not as overt as it is in these books and these stories. Uh, you know who called it almost exactly, mm -hmm. and almost nobody quotes or gives credit to. Uh, I just posted a link we can put in the show notes. This is Lawrence Lessig. Uh, if you've watched the documentary about the internet's own boy and lamented the loss of uh, Aaron Schwartz at any point, he's the glass, the guy with the glasses that talks in that. Okay. A Harvard law professor who wrote this book called Code in the 90s that a lot of the cypherpunks latched onto. It's where the, the sort, sort of code is law concept got discussed the first time. Nice. Yeah, hold that thought because there is a book question later on, I think, and we can talk about that. Well, um, in Code V2, which I post, we post a link to, he predicts that he was wrong about any of it being utopian and then sort of calls today. It's pretty nuts. Nice. I will read that. I'll look into that. Um, so like I said, though, uh, moving into the questions, we, we, that's, that's our topic. We want to talk about pop culture and we want to talk about the history of cryptography, blockchain and metaverse in pop culture specifically. Yep. And so that's what we have asked people to um, give us topics or questions about that we can discuss jumping off points for conversation, things like that. Um, so uh, let's see, let's do, 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 do. Um, do we need to define this topic? It's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, you know, I, I think that there's so much of it that we, we may have to define some things when we get the specifics, but. Okay, well, yeah. let's, let's hold on to that then. Let's go Just, down. Uh, if it seems to get heady, call me out because I'll, I'll gloss over definitions too readily sometimes. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. All right, let's see. We've got I Am For I Am, a regular on this show. Thank you for coming back yeah. and, and helping us out. AI well, my first thought, by the way, was the smart question guy from last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. Always smart yeah. questions. I had a lot of smart questions for me yesterday on, on coffee that had to do with statistics and specific contracts and what's this and what's cool. that. I love digging uh, digging in with people like that. So I, awesome. I am says, AI computes so differently than humans. Question, do you think AI could play a big role in creating a completely different method of encryption that could lead to a next level of encryption? How cool would it be if cryptocurrency was working with AI to encrypt and secure blockchain data? That yeah, would be the same cool. idea. Um, and every time I suggest it, I get rocks thrown at me by Austin, who actually yeah. really doesn't like it, even though it technically kind of makes sense. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. I think there's there's an argument for it. I right? think that it reminds me a little bit of um, there was there was a an AI. Uh, an engineering AI, right? Mm. I don't know what it was called or whatever, but um, what's the Formula One, right? The the race cars, the small with the wings and the right. You're talking you're talking about that, yeah. So there was uh, that's that's an industry that's always always honing any little thing where they can take off any little amount of weight or improve aerodynamics, that competitive edge, that kind of thing. So they put mm. that problem to this AI architect of cars that was made. And it came out with this weird freaking honeycomb shaped looking structure frame. Uh, and it dramatically like changed the aerodynamics beneficially. But it was mm -hmm. something that was so bizarre that probably no human would have taken a fluke for a human to come up with that maybe, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what this question reminds me of a little bit. Do you think that AI could do that with cryptography and find um, novel solutions that maybe the human brains collectively wouldn't have even thought to come up with but like, oh shit, that does work. And then maybe- we Absolutely. Um, we're a little ways off in terms of the right kind of AI, or we don't know we already created it and it's already running. Mm -hmm. um, that's another, <laughs> another funny possibility is there's a, there is enough compute power happening in the hashing of, of uh, blocks that it would be you know, pretty hard to spot sort of a pattern in all that chaos that might be just emergent. Sort of like the Hyperion Cantos theory of AI emergence, where it was like somebody doing an e life experiment they accidentally accidentally left on in a basement server, <laughs> and it turned into the, the super intelligence after thirty years. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I think, but I do actually know a couple projects that are worth mentioning. Um, yeah, I don't. So let's let's talk about. It. Yeah, yeah, I actually had the good fortune to meet uh, somebody who works in uh, building a chain to provide hashing power. Now he's really creating a marketplace for uh, not hashing power, but, but um, a compute for training algorithms. Mm, okay. Um, and if you've played around with uh, with any of the GPTJ stuff, the truly open source uh, analog to GPT three. Um, then you've played around with something that he that his blockchain helped to train. Okay. Um, and you know they're doing really neat stuff with NFT generation uh, on that project too. I met this artist and she was making this uh, soul AI project. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea was essentially uh, you know, bring people into contact with sensors while they form intents, kind of like um, oh, uh, what's the quantum random number generator based chain that did. Um, uh, random knots. Not familiar. Don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, I may have heard their name if you come up with it. But that's just fine. look up random knots, um, okay. and you'll you'll be able to find their org. But, I haven't been following the NFT drop so closely, so I'm not I'm not familiar with a lot of that. What yeah. is the what what does that bring though? Um, so you're training AIs with this blockchain platform, big mm -hmm. platform or whatever. What does the cryptocurrency in the in and what is how does that beneficial to training AI? Is it more of a it's a competitive marketplace for stray aggregate compute power, kind of like an open source, public, decentralized version of uh, spot instances on AWS? Okay, so this is something like Flux or Kudos or something like that. Sort yeah, of like this just, yeah. just but more complex than that. Like, I mean, because different sorts of GPUs and TPUs and things matter for different types of machine sure. learning. Yeah, just like um, AWS, you can be like, I want a, a bunch of GPUs to, to crack this, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, but but the two things we have to do with AI before we could use it for a hashing algorithm or for some kind of uh, consensus mechanism that we could trust, so we'd have to black box it completely, right? Uh, if people can tamper with it, it's not a, a neutral consensus mechanism. What about um, bias and AI? Because I've seen um, I've seen some discussion on that recently too, where there's there's new studies going in to sort of see okay, do our do our algorithms have bias because they were built by biased people, that kind of thing. Can, uh, we're should, trained by biased data, right? Yeah. So what if whenever you train uh, AI traditionally, do you just for example, let's say it's photos, right? And you're training based on photos. This is a spider. This is a butterfly. You know that kind yeah. of thing. Um, I don't know much about this, but is that training cataloged? Do you still know what images in what order and what sequence it, train the AI? It depends on what you use, um, and what you're talking about is, is sort of explorable and explainable AI, um, which is something that you know ultimately I was initially kind of um, uh, miffed about when I first started learning it because I, I took the the uh, Andrew on AI course they offered very early on um, when sort of people were saying, Hey, machine learning. Like I was all, I was all hyped up on Kurzweil's uh, how to build a mind book. And I was just like, I'm going to learn this shit. So I signed up for a course um, and did like five projects and then did a hackathon project based on it uh, for the place I was working at the time. Um, and there's just so many different kinds of networks that like are, some are meant to process images by decomposing them into uh, individual pixels or really windows of pixels that you slide across the image. Um, uh, that's got some disadvantages to zero shot learning that you might do if you're trying to identify objects on a camera, like it's too slow for a self-driving car. Okay. So there, there are techniques they had to create for that. Um, there's something called capsule net that's designed to do the same thing for 3d or multiple D environments. Um, if you're not talking about just a flat image, what about a 3D space? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about a 5D? Yeah, uh, looks... What about a 5D calculation uh, to do with some kind of quantum mechanics question or something like that? Imagery or is like a thousand D yeah. uh, math problem. Got you. Yeah, images themselves are hard. I was watching something that I was convinced. I, I have watched it over and over and over again. You know, human brain particularly good at pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Still couldn't figure out what I'm looking at. It, but it was such a very like basic video. It was somebody who filmed what appeared to be a helicopter chasing a UFO that was smoking and going down like and mm -hmm. I mean, and it looked exactly like 
like, man, there's this little ball flying with smoke coming off of it and a helicopter's chasing it. That's crazy. I kept watching right. it over and over again. And I finally so, realized that what so, it was, was the angle because you were talking about 3D space and how things looked mm -hmm. different. I finally realized that it was exactly keeping up with it. And at the angle, it was a it was a fire team with a big mm -hmm. bucket of water that was flying over. It was carrying a bucket, not chasing a UFO. And the smoke mm -hmm. was just water spraying out from the wind. And I was like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like, you know, to, to sort of steer this back towards the question, right? Like the challenge is threefold, right? Uh, one, our AIs do not learn in real time. We train them and then we deploy them. And until we teach them something new, most forms of it are dead in the water until you actively unplug it and retrain it. So it's not going to be able to learn constantly until we get to what's called online learning. That's not something that we've done with you know, the, the headline making splashy deep learning networks. There wasn't, um, there wasn't an environment running in a black box that was talking in plain language or, you know, natural language to the guys who ran the go game. Right. Um, yeah, like you see in the, there, there was a team of engineers operating the, the prediction, every move that was still a lot of people intervention, right? We can't have any people intervention if it's going to be trustworthy. So online learning, and we have to make the AI know when it needs to kill its own server and spin up a new instance. So what do we do? We, do we uh, do we allow the AI to rewrite its own code to fix its own errors and stuff like that? Is that well, dangerous? I mean, doesn't that sound mildly dangerous? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, what if it starts? I mean, even even in a uh, you know, a blockchain uh, type of level of problem, right? We're talking massive amounts of global economy someday, right? We have to really trust that thing not to decide it's going to create a new way to think about it that nobody in uh you know nobody in the human side of the api understands anymore mm -hmm. you know. i um so bringing it back to pop culture a little bit <clears throat> the representation of ai in you know from a couple of the authors that i mentioned earlier it's mm -hmm. my favorite but even modern like um there's a game called cyberpunk 2077 that, I love that game. Actually, I played it. I've played it all the way through several times. Yeah, yeah, I've had a couple of endings myself. Have you had the ending with the AI? This is what I was getting at. Have you had the AI ending? You can. No, add, I, I'm. They take concepts from all of these classic sci-fi metaverse, mm -hmm. like cyberpunk, when all these terms were first coined, whatever, and they do a really good job of faithfully, uh, like so many Easter eggs in that in that game for sure. They refer to specific other stories in the past. But one of them was the AI, and it was sort of like the AI from, um, oh, which one is it? Is it Neuromancer that has the AI uh, mm -hmm. entities? Um, I think so, yeah. And um, it was a very, it was very much like what I was talking about, where an AI is, um, uh, can update its own code, can update itself, and does so exponentially fast over time, and then they start working together, and then eventually, you just have this piece of software that lives in the network. You know, it's in cyberspace. It doesn't manifest physically. It doesn't do anything in the physical world. It just lives in cyberspace. Right. And they're leveraged almost like a foreign nation sometimes whenever a lowly human needs to break through some ice, break through mm -hmm. some encryption to, you know, do a certain thing. It's, it's interesting. So it's like this far future alliances between uh mankind and ai kind kind of yep. thing oh absolutely alliances and uh, even coalitions within subsects of ai that sort of form like imagine ai's forming DAOs. You know, yeah that are their sure. coalitions right and some of them are currently siding with the humans who are currently in power and some of them are against them and some of them want to kill all the humans and some of them think uh think they need to leave humanity behind and, and disappear like uh some of that science fiction canon is really fascinating now i, I think is. the more you know like the more re relevant right now questions are like you know okay it hasn't got the ability to make itself modular and to program itself to do things that we don't give it the concepts for it's not mm -hmm. um like mm -hmm. we would notice if for some reason all of the tpus in uh you know in google cloud platform uh, started firing without without commands towards what appeared to be an intentional end that everybody was suddenly locked out of, like a cyber attack. Uh, we'd notice that shit. They'd probably turn it off. 
What um, about it's humanoids? Until it can sneak, you know, that much strategy into something that uses the same, you know, the same amount of wattage as a, a regular average toaster, which is human brains. Like that's amazing. What about that, test humanoids? And do you think that there's any correlation between um, those robots and with AI and uh, Neuralink? Can can AI can AI learn from something like Neuralink where they have Here's what I'm thinking is yeah no a, you're you're absolutely you're onto something important. Yeah, there's a Japanese study where uh, it frightens the shit out of me, but they have demonstrated the ability to read your thoughts to a certain extent. Right. And what they by just decoding the electromagnetics at the yeah very level. very simple method that's not very accurate, but basically they showed people dramatically different images and measured what their brain looks like when they're looking at and thinking about that image, and mm -hmm. then they took pictures away and said now think about this image. And it matched. It's the same. They're thinking about it. It's pretty close to when they were looking at it. And so right. they figured out how to look at it and be like, oh, this person's thinking about a banana right now. Right. This and person now everybody who's paranoid has to start trying to figure out what the anti-pattern looks like that they have to imagine in order to break it. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Where, do, so where do we go? And how, how do we get to maybe this that is the stuff question. is that stuff we have to. The, the thing is, we get to build all of this. We don't have AIs that are going to have emergent traits. You know, and and this, this is what we have to realize. It sounds like scary science, mm -hmm. but it's a kind of pattern recognizer that can uh, take in uh, some data and transform it into a network of weights that when you run data that doesn't fail for formatting issues with it, like it has to match, um, it can it can predict uh, needles and haystacks from new data sets it's never seen before if it's trained right. And from all that emerges everything we do with AI today. Everything. Just hmm. it's a it's a dumb pattern recognizer that has to be taken offline uh, and trained to the tune of millions of dollars worth of energy expenditure uh, a day. So uh, at, this, at this moment, the real risk is that we do something with it that we really ought not. Isn't that a little bit what we are? Dumb pattern recognition people that have to go to sleep and reboot. Oh, wake up with we're far more uh we're far more elegant machines yeah but you could you, you could probably argue that you know we go through the day and we we have our experiences and we take in data mm -hmm. and then we process and code that and we wake up and move on with a different day well, could that not you, be you might think that like getting into the first details but we're really more maybe like okay so are you familiar with the thousand brains theory of intelligence that's when you have to have to really get nope so nope. And I probably should avoid computational neuroscience at any depth um, because it's like Good show probably yeah <laughs> it's boring until you hear the the last word of a of a three or four complicated sentences. But if you'll bear with me, I can I think I can get us there quickly. Okay, let's make like, it quick. <laughs> the first flatworm right had a neural network that could sense its location in space. Uh, and sense when it bumped its nose into something mm -hmm. and move around obstacles. That was it. That's all yeah. its brain did. That's how I started programming. I had a video um, game. That's all we did was program bugs to bump into stuff and know when to turn. <laughs> right. And, and fiddling with it. And cats have a similar thing in their olfactory that you can, you can uh, tease with an electrode um, in a totally non inhumane or not inhumane way and just trigger off sense of direction feelings. Um, roughly what the basic neuron does at the very lowest level, much it's more like a bundle of sub bits that make up a neural cluster in, um, and we're talking cerebrum right now. We're not talking any of the others. They do different stuff. Um, intelligence is what we're interested in, not anger. <laughs> yeah. uh, machine anger is not something we should build, but um, uh yeah, I've seen the experience. That model, that model, think of your brain as a big collection of flatworms um, that has lots of models for lots of different things. And you can do an experiment with this. Um, if you have a cup nearby, do you have a cup nearby? Uh, yeah. Gra grab your cup, uh, set it down, close your eyes, mm -hmm. grab your cup. Mm -hmm. What part of it is your thumb resting on? Same part as it was. Um, what would you oh, describe that part with your eyes closed? Like the lip, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the lip of the, the edge or whatever. Yeah. Right. Brain scan would reveal one particular part of your cerebrum activating your cup on the desk model uh, in the feel part because you had your eyes closed. 
Mm -hmm. so uh, you've been and it's also probably triggering some language section things because you know you're talking about it, but um, little models of specific things just running in parallel. That's that's roughly intelligence. Okay. I mean, that is, is the theory. Like, the, it's, it's a pretty sound one, but... I would imagine that that's how I would probably have to approach building that, you know? Right. So, but humans are weirder than that because we've got a brain no, that maybe. thinks and learns and we're also playing reward punishment games with ourselves in the environment with other agents. So we've got a really complicated, massive reinforcement learning system in a game world that makes all of its decisions based on probability in a really complicated cluster of models. Cool. So, <laughs> so we're, we're way, way, way more advanced than, than the most advanced thing we have ever made. Sure. We've had a lot of time to, uh, yeah. our programming though, haven't we? Right. And I, I guess my point is I wouldn't trust a blockchain, uh, consensus mechanism that wasn't smarter than me at doing that one thing. And that's maybe achievable, but we'd have to think about it carefully. I see what you're saying. So the human the human guidance is still very much, it sounds like that's what our safety check is. It's just people. We'd end up with a lot of like Solana-esque, the, the decentralized, immutable, public, permissionless blockchain is down. Uh, our corporate team will let you know when it's back up and running um, type of moments with our algorithm. We'd be t way too tempted to take it down and fix it. Mm. Um, because in all likelihood it would crash the first 15 times we tried to launch it. Is time an issue with AI? Like, I don't know anybody who pays for access to AI services or whatever. So but it, You have to retrain it every time you catch it making a systemic mistake in its pattern recognition. Okay. Right. right on, so, right on. you know, like we just spent a billion dollars on TPUs for the last month and uh, it can't tell the difference between red, orange and orange, red. And that's important. Right. That's a, that's like a breaking thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Game breaking bug. <laughs> right. So, you know, um, and actually we should probably do like an AI show later and bring my cousin on okay. um, who's yeah. studying. Well, he's just finishing up his PhD program in California right now on this one, um, doing machine learning, uh, reinforcement learning, specific tasks related to robotics. So awesome. Hey, someone suggests that if, if one of us doesn't, for uh, whenever you uh, are voting for the next topics. Let's let's get that one in the mix and see how many people want to do it. Um, let's move let's move down and see what's next on the questions here. Moving on from AI, Jacob Wayne is back with a question. Thank you for that. Did the public realize how important Snow Crash was when it was published or did it build up notoriety later when blockchain technologies entered the scene? Um, I, I replied to this one already, but basically I, um, I think that, uh, let's see, a lot of people started seeing similarities as soon as it was, uh, like Snow Crash was, like it's one of the de facto, oh, predicted metaverse kind of thing. Just oh, like yeah. answer is one of the de facto, oh, coined uh, cyberpunk as a subculture, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think that, um, I don't know how much of the influence from that book and others like it ended up accelerating our march towards a metaverse. Mm -hmm. Like that's the question I have. If those books weren't written, would we has, have as quickly uh, come to uh, such a similar reality or was the book written because from- Because we were headed that way anyway. Like looking at what's around them today, looking at where, technology is going and where society is going yeah. and predicting that if this continues, we're going to end up in this sort of world and then writing a, a fiction about it. Uh, yeah. I think, it, I think it was a cautionary tale, frankly, you know, I think it was, it was, this is what will happen if we're thoughtless in the way that we are when I wrote this um, kind of prediction, you know, and I, I think that we're, we're probably more thoughtful in some ways and less in others. Um. <clears throat> But like, my, it's a really interesting idea. You know, does the science fiction beget the, the breakthrough or does the breakthrough uh, just emerge later because doing the science and making the technology work and then engineering it is yeah, so take it's Star just Wars, uh, Not Star Wars, take Star Trek, for example, the uh, warp engine, right? Mm -hmm. The warp engine as proposed by Star Trek. You're talking about QB air drive, right? Is, is literally being developed right now, is being worked on. The yep. one where you... Space in front of you and behind you. 
So that you need an isotope that does not. That's true. In a synthetic form yet. Yeah, we have something we don't. There's something that we don't have to make that work. Mm -hmm. But mathematically, it could exist. And so what we worked on is like, okay, let's assume that that'll be available one day and get everything else figured out in, in the meantime. And it's this whole thing about like, really, you're not moving faster than the speed of light. You're just like relative to the space you're in. You're not. Mm-hmm. But the space itself is moving, which is a lot of how, you know, mm-hmm. some theory about uh, multiverse and how the extreme, you know, the the horizon of the the, the visible knowable universe. Yeah. Is, and see, I still believe that we'll get to indefinite mm-hmm. life extension before we ever get to a ship that can uh, that can use a conception of relativity that I don't think we've got quite right. No, we don't have a, we don't have a lot of stuff quite right. I mean, we've like enough though. Uh, I, we probably shouldn't open the the uh, <laughs> the loop quantum gravity uh, rabbit hole, but I'm I'm one of those like standard model rejectors. So, okay. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought there. I'm sorry. So we were talking about chicken or egg, you know, before or after. Maybe a little bit of both. Um, yeah. What are some things that were pre- predicted accurately? And if you're not as familiar with with that, I can I can probably go. Oh yeah, no, we can we can. Because uh, I'm about... curious to see. Let, let's leave this open for the comments for a second and just like see what people say. If anybody wants to throw something in before we talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm gonna bring the comments over here just so I can see them. But yeah, what do you think? Um, the question was about Snow Crash specifically. So what uh, in the story of hero protagonist um, and YZ or, or YT and all of those characters, what what was what was right? What they get right? All right. Uh, I talked about corporate control of politics. Right. It was very much overt. Obviously, then the United States was just kind of uh, sanctioned into a you know, not much of anything at all. Um, the U.S. is like a company of yesteryear where the companies are the government, you know. Um, but also, obviously, the metaverse, where you had the Black Pyramid and you had the um, uh, people accessing it from wherever they were to meet up in a common area and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. But there was also, um, there was more to it than that. You know, there was like robot dogs that came from, that actually had dog brains to run them. There was uh, pizza delivery was the most important job, you know, and <laughs> getting it there on time was uh, right. like, so, you know, incentivized to the point where there was both incentives and punishment if you didn't get it right for the employees. So that sort of employer rights instead of employee rights, sort of dystopian thing. Mm-hmm. Um, other kind of things that you can, can you think of where, uh, you know, like the trivial is very important or the uh, privacy is not something that is, uh, you know, like I had a picture of a gargoyle in that reply I made. And yeah. in, the, in the book series, the gargoyles were people that had all of these sensors all over them that could pick up all the signals and uh, see different spectrums of light. And, you know, maybe one's an X-ray, so they see what you're carrying on you. And it was kind of like, oh, yeah, people can see everything you do. There's no privacy. Um, yeah, I think that's something that the cypherpunks kind of got right. Um, mm-hmm. But also, I don't think that they anticipated how much everybody else would sort of catch up to them and care. You know? Um uh, like maybe they got the the idea that we wouldn't have any, um, but I don't think anybody's really super blithe about it. Anybody super what? Super blithe about it. Like I I feel like I meet way more people who actually lament that in a way that's kind of visceral rather than going oh well, you know I'll just uh, I will just walk around naked from now on. Yeah, I mean there's def I. I suffer from that mindset a lot of like, um, ah, this sucks, but I don't know what I'm going to do about it. You know, mm. I try to fight against that a lot because that's that's what gets us into trouble. But yeah. um, well, yeah. I think we, we get we are actually doing it still. Like we're fighting against it. You know, the the, the advantage that the many kind of have is is the um, the wisdom of crowds phenomenon, right? Ultimately, some of us are going to try to solve it by focusing on something else. And that's great. Like we need people to raise good families. We need people to care about, you know, all of the details of the thing that they care most about, but there are other people who are going to try to fix it. And, you know, 99.99% of them are going to get it slightly wrong. It's not going to work. One guy invents the right light bulb filament, man. 
The idea of specialization is something I haven't thought of in a while because you just said that basically and you're reminding me of how many experts are on the internet. <laughs> you That's know? amazing actually. Um, some, some of them are legitimately worthy of being called experts relative to the ones that existed before the internet. Oh, I'm just being, I'm, I actually just, it was a joke. There's like, what I'm trying to say is oh, I, I, referring to an expert is um, less common, I guess. True, true. I don't think we have as many experts that synthesize, but I definitely think we have um, you know, a way better analytics base than we ever had just from like human uh, minds looking at problems and trying to pick them apart. I am for I am says when we know our past, knowing history rhymes, we can contemplate our future with better accuracy. I think this is how writers are good at predictions. I think that's an accurate statement. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, oh, I had something there. I was saving it and then I lost it, but that's all right. Um, with, I guess my uh, question is how, can, how well can we really ever know our past? Oh, you always it, say that thing about you always bring out the fact that until the first, uh, you know, the first block was yeah. ever validated, that we never really had any meaningful history we can right. yes. we can trust That's, without questioning. Thank you for digging into my brain virtually and, and <laughs> there. But yeah, the um, the thing with the past it, repeating itself, it could be a symptom of uh, unre uh, unreliable um documentation right or mm -hmm. biased documentation or something like that right or just theories of history theories of knowledge like all of it creates so much possible gray zone and i when i say gray zone i do not mean like everything's gray nothing's black and white i mean that there are shades of gray that approach so light they approach white and then the gradient runs all the way up to approaching black we never really mm -hmm. have zero or 100 percent probability but we have discrete ones in you know, infinite sets of infinite sets all the way up. Uh, saying something is gray is not an excuse not to look at it closely. Um, but applying uh, that about history and blockchain, applying that a little bit to the first question about um, you know AI using blockchain and cryptocurrency, um, I wonder if there's something. I'm sure there is something there about if if AI is there's a maybe there's a history AI right mm -hmm. AI that learns about history and uses that kind of you um, remind me of a fun rabbit hole with AI and history, if you're interested. Uh, yeah, uh, have you, have you, are you familiar with Roko's Basilisk? No, no, no. Um, but basically, I was just saying, you know, if, if, if history is suddenly more reliable, is that going, you know, would that produce a better AI? Because you had well, just having more reliable data. data were, his, that, were history as, sufficiently reliable to uh, to tell us what we really needed to know without any room for argument? Would it be too much data to deal with? So, of course, sort of what I wonder. I don't know if it would be too much data. I, I'm just wondering if um, if it's healthier, you know, maybe it's healthier to to train on, you know, mathematically verifiably uh, accurate mm -hmm. data that's not right. Oh, to the best of our ability to get it, and bias, I guess. I don't know. Right. How to that the best of our going. ability to get there's there's a bias element of the machine learning the standard machine learning algorithm that is never zero and is never one two um, and it's supposed to account for bias properly, um, but it doesn't account for biases in the preconceived notions it has. So our training says what we can screw up. Um, well, I mean, there's lots of other things, but um, I only got an AI to run without help once, um, and I jumped up and down as it did something like. Uh, somebody talked know. about in the '60s, and and people who study it seriously do their first day of class. But awesome. Um, but I was super excited about it. Um, but but I was going to say something else though. Um, I lost my train of thought. That's all right because I was just reviewing, um, and it looks like this this does actually bleed into the next question very nicely. Perfect. Um, we keep doing one. that. Yeah, let's do that. Um, Y'all Weird is saying, or is asking, in the context of life imitates art, do you see a future similar to Ready Player One manifesting when the metaverse becomes globally adopted? If so, how important do you feel it is to create new film and literature depicting protopian future in the metaverse? We do talk like, you would talk about dystopian sci-fi and uh, stuff like that, but yeah, protopian stuff where you can 
all of it and i wanted all those novels it can get you know like yeah. i think we need every idea represented to the extent we can come up with it if we're going to get the best ideas good enough if it's as good as the dystopian stuff right yeah. i feel like it's easy to look at it at the dystopian stuff and say oh wow all of this is is extremely plausible right, right? like we've talked about fermi paradox before together right yeah yeah, yeah. like where's okay so ai could be a great filter right I think that's could one be. of the biggest problems with it. If we could did it be. wrong, we could end up, you know, ending the known universe of available uh, energy, uh, like right down to absolute zero in paper clips, like just because we tell a machine learning algorithm to optimize the manufacturer and we give it too much capability. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, be, yeah. Can, we can mess up mundanely in ways that are catastrophic when we start playing with, you know, like planet scale computing and stuff which if we want the species to last, right, we have to really be prepared to think of. If, uh, if anyone's unfamiliar, the Fermi paradox is basically, uh, and, the, and the great filter concept is that at some point in civilization of any race, anywhere in the galaxy, the universe, there's some sort of maybe multiple filters that you pass through where uh, the civilization just doesn't survive it and they go away. And that's why we don't see anybody out there. Right. Or right? maybe life emerges, but intelligence doesn't pop up. So stuff um, like that. So different things could be that barrier. Like you don't cross that threshold and you never become spacefaring, uh, you know, and that way, you, or you never develop the radio because of this. Right. You know, well, between you and me and the internet, I think we're past it personally. But, um, and I, I think that the great filter was cooking because it's a really weird thing. Austin cool, convinced me of it. <laughs> the cool thing about that opinion that I like a lot is that it suggests that the reason we don't see, Okay, if you assume there's not UFOs everywhere, which we've established there are, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we should really it, fact it, that one, and that's true. Yeah, that would mean that we're one of the one of the first, if not the first, probably just well, one of. Nobody wants to talk about the UFO theory where someone invented time travel, and that's just us. To 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 get through that filter, right? If if we're past it, it could be that the reason we don't see anybody nearby in space is because they have they haven't passed it. We did. Maybe they're still working on it. Maybe they died because they didn't yeah. do. Well, or know. seriously, we do have to consider the possibility that you know uh, we find the exotic matter, we warp space time, we learn to travel. We we learn to travel backwards in it and reset. Uh, you know, basically return to current times in history, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that technology could not be an advanced alien race. It could be us coming it back to be. save ourselves from our own stupidity. I think the fact that they like to shut nukes off is a pretty good uh, uh, piece of medium strength evidence for that theory. I haven't thought about that before. Um, I've seen Doctor Who uh, ex ex explore that, mm -hmm. where the aliens are actually us coming back mm -hmm. from the future kind of thing. And that was really interesting. But um, I haven't thought about that in the context of shutting off nuclear warheads and things like that, um, because that's, you know, that is super interesting. Yeah. Um, we may have saved ourselves from ourselves. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. I'm glad we talked about that. That's, that's cool. <laughs> but, but it's, um, alien blockchain. I don't know how you would do that except to, um, uh, I, I wish the UFO community would realize how important the blockchain is for securing information and validating yeah. information because there's so many, uh, communities like that who mm -hmm. are marginalized because of how extreme their, research is how silly it might seem or how silly somebody else makes it seem um right let well, I me mean, and the ultimate thing is um when it really comes to blockchains if you want to say to somebody something that they will immediately interpret the negative but they should go whoa okay now i get it they are a better way to do databases once we engineer them to a sufficient capability right like they're not better than most databases that don't have uh you know, a consensus mechanism to true them up that isn't people calling each other on the phone and reading numbers off of a screen in an accounting procedure, right? Like, um, ultimately, what the 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 uh, double entry ledger did for paper databases, we built into computer databases. It creates race conditions, all this nastiness. It's hard to build scalable systems with um, that that don't have. Uh, disagreement problems across basically different instances of the same so-called data set and I'll blockchains can make it one data set, right? Yeah. Like they're yeah. better, they're a better database. So everywhere I'll... databases work. Blockchains will work. 
and I, better, uh, ultimately. Yeah, eventually. Um, I was, I was uh, well, in some cases now, I was talking to a database guy in Miami during Bitcoin week. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he was just basically poo-pooing on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin's mm -hmm. the only thing that it, you know, matters, which is fine. I, I love well, hopefully, to Hopefully, hopefully he got some good chest thumps in and maybe got like a, a, a about Bitcoin that. maximalist uh, that he was attracted to, to go, go out for drinks with him because he thumped hard enough. He, um, uh, we, we had a lot of drinks that night. He was buying. So I was like, all right, whatever. Oh, that's cool. And, um, we were talking about, uh, you know, in databases and blockchains. And I was talking about a, a private messenger that I like a lot. And he was arguing, well, what do you do? You just put all the messages on chain. <laughs> and I was like, no, not, not right now. Maybe eventually, but right now it's just incentivized. Right. Notes. You can use it for different things. Every right. little also thing. way to conveniently forget about file level encryption. Like just because we invented a new encryption technique for securing databases over networks doesn't mean we forget about file encryption. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, blockchains as databases. That, I think that's eventually that's where we're headed. It seems right. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Time. Like that's the natural. That's going. It is the natural evolution. And I was reading something recently. You know, kind of. Uh, it was probably you know it was probably a, a tweet from someone that was trying to console people in a in a in a terrible market at the time or something. But mm -hmm. saying that um you know if if you if you're in this and you have a deep knowledge of blockchains and cryptocurrencies because you've just been here for years now. There's Web2 companies that are going to be coming in late that need to get up to speed, and they're going to want what you know. So yep. like just 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 absorbing information over the years while all the stuff develops, while it's all primordial still. Mm -hmm. um, positions, anybody who's paying attention for the future, which is great. To me, that's the really – that's the, the – um, oh, uh, a really interesting question about um about the top stuff it's it's gone right. I, I lost it again um i think I do that from time to time so it's it's funny that it's we're right <laughs> we uh we have a very chill show i think i like it yeah like the, um, the dave and greg format I, i'd be curious as to whether people like um sort of the two pair because we could do a series of shows like that like once a month just have you know uh, pick your host and pick your host and it's just two people. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, I'm, I'm working on, maybe we could just do a different show. I think that, uh, me and you and, uh, Satoshi, Sean mm -hmm. and maybe Florian that was on a few weeks back. Um, I, I want to do I, like a call in. Well, I always wanted to do a show in the cannabis layer, <laughs> yes. you know, just to sit around and talk. It doesn't have to be about blockchain, but it probably will because we're all blockchain. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. I wanted to pick up the last half of the all weirds question though is you know um yeah no we should but, but then what would that look like let's let's say let's say it's very important and that's the answer right mm -hmm. but what it look like I know that you talk about what's possible one of the things that I like to talk about whenever I'm talking about this kind of stuff is that Bitcoin is transparent and maybe that's a good thing uh, like it's not a privacy coin you can see everything that happens on it and maybe that's really really good for government use you know mm -hmm. maybe should pay taxes in Bitcoin so we can see exactly where that shit goes. Um, and that can be something that enables a protopian, you know, government accountability type of situation, you know, like uh, Zcash or Monero for the people and Bitcoin or whatever uh, uh, Bitcoin analog that you like for the government where you have mm -hmm. both worlds, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, and, and probably some systems that we don't really have conceived of well yet. Because I don't think that we're probably, you know, going to be able to wait for, you know, storage and compute technology and networking technology to catch up to where it would need to be to, you know, not crash a reasonably constructed blockchain with NFT projects by storing them directly on chain, right? We're going to have to come up with a decentralized data store uh, for content that we can we can feel reasonably comfortable standardizing in an open source sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm dabbling with a few things like that. Um, I'm building a small company that's based, it's, it's intended to be local and maybe one day if we ever scale up, it'll just be additional um, cities kind of thing. But mm -hmm. um, part of what we're doing is, is, is uh, making ourselves um, walk the walk 
I guess you could say, you know, mm -hmm. talk about all these potentials and all these possibilities and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, we sort of took the the uh, the idea of, OK, let's profit by being really useful and helping people while also using mm -hmm. as much as possible only um, decentralized technology uh, and or open source. Um, and if we can't find all the things we need, maybe we make some. Yeah. And so that was interesting. And so the storage cool. layer, there's a couple of really good like data storage layers um, out there that are reliable and redundant and fast and stuff like that. There's, um, you know, there's there's chains that do the same thing that a database does that actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, even I'll plug Dragon Chain real quick. Dragon Chain can actually use uh, something like a traditional database and turn it into your private business blockchain and in, in mm -hmm. kind of thing, which can then, can then leverage, you know, Bitcoin and say, OK, not only is it here, but I can prove it with Bitcoin's like the literal same hash power as Bitcoin is using and why everyone thinks that's bulletproof. Yeah, mm -hmm. we use that, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's stuff there's stuff out there now and there's stuff out there that's really you watched Black Mirror before I watched. I've watched a lot of it. Yeah, I haven't did seen you, that. Did you watch, watch. Um, the one that was like uh, it started with uh, like you're know, like you're going to say San Francisco, but it ended with something different. It was about uh, the two women who met across different time periods and then ended up uh, falling in love at the end, but they were really on their deathbeds and being uploaded. Mm. Mm -mm. Uh, Maybe it's like the only one with a happy ending ever that I've seen. Yes. The happy uh, ending. I know it has the happy ending one. It yeah. was the one where everybody Cause was because the, the girl was bedridden her whole life and was like not able to see the world even through her own senses. Yeah, right. Yeah. That one cool. is that the same one where they were they were basically uploaded into the they were plugged in and now they live forever in the machine. Right. Which and is the zoom out is playing that last song where you watch the robots maintain it. Right. To a certain I degree, know. I think storage yeah. that does what we need it to do is going to have robots maintaining it. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I would love um, for, so that is cool. I hadn't thought about that in a long time, but that's exactly what y'all weird yeah. talk about. Is what right, is exactly. A, his story. But, yeah. you know, I think the cool thing about his question is it says the metaverse and talks about the shaping of it. But I think the metaverse is going to become the story. And I did share with you, Dave, in the comments, and we should put it in the show notes, um, a wait, but why article about Neuralink where he did the yeah. whole like Musk treatment and interviewed on it. Yeah, we I need see that. The beginning of it. That's great. Hey, you're Elon Musk. I want to build a wizard hat for the brain. <laughs> <laughs> we need that thing. And that's why Neuralink needs to exist because otherwise we can't co create in digital space fast enough. I have, um, and maybe blockchain is really necessary for that kind of thing because what if you can replace data sets? That you access like a payload just like snow crash the, right. the literal what the book is uh the title is about right right how do you prevent a snow crash well right. with neural a I consensus think, protocol that's got good community involvement a dao coupled yeah, with right. a consensus mechanism to prove that the and dao's will is being done you can validate the data that you're accessing before you access it that kind of thing right because and the, about, the update uh, to the security mechanism was accepted by everybody who has an opinion yeah and and um like I remember my biology teacher when I was in high school saying that like they're working on this shit that's going to be able to clip on like a like what we see today as a Bluetooth, you know, ear mm -hmm. thing. And it's going to be like a memory bank where you can access data and know things and like, oh, I need to know this stuff today. Oh, mm -hmm. I need to know this stuff today. That kind of thing. And how how uh, game changing that is for right. uh, surgeons, for you know, like IT people that have to Google all the answers. Well, what if it's just right. in your brain? Or just like it? you wanting to look something up on your phone, but instead you keep looking at the trees because the thought popped into your head already and we don't need those damn screens anymore. Yeah. Well, that's that's what Elon talks a lot about right. a lot, that we're already... Um, right, thumbs are a low bandwidth form of, uh, of data right. input. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are already augmented humans. We are already... Um, what do you call it? Not not androids, but uh, we are uh, cybernetic organisms. Cybernetic organisms, right? In a way. That there's one. There's still one step of of uh, like it's still an external thing. Our phone. All right. Well, we've Already. been doing it for way longer than we even really know. Like it's prehistory. We've been augmenting ourselves. You know, uh, somebody tied a splint to somebody's leg well before we recorded it was done. 
Mm, yeah, this needs to be straight. That's straight. What if we tie that to that? <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody yeah. probably was like, no, you're crazy. We need to hang that guy. He's a witch. Yeah. Uh, um, we can see mine here on the questions. Um, but I was just wanting to know if you could recommend some books and stuff. I threw some in there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'll, um, God, I, have, I have probably way too many books. So what I'll do is I'll just screenshot my, uh, my iBooks library and then cut out the ones that, uh, that are irrelevant. Cause like, yeah, I, um, I download a lot of, I download a lot of, uh, eBooks from the internet and just keep them and read bits and pieces. Yeah, I, I did that a lot in the Navy. When I was deployed, I carried a thumb drive and it just had hundreds of books, ebooks on it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where they all came from. We just shared hard drives a lot, movies, books, whatever, that kind yeah. of thing. Another good question along those lines, do you know of any good uh, data repositories that are just hanging out there on the internet still? You know, places where people dump docs from a long time ago that are just still sitting up? Well, there's text files, mm -hmm. uh, which is maintained by a guy that works at archive.org now mm -hmm. and archive has a lot of um data that is not only historical but a lot of work has been done to emulate the systems that are needed to display that properly mm -hmm. uh, oh i love archive you can games, watch games and and movies from the 20s um it's fantastic yeah i don't know otherwise um i'm not really sure if you're if you're uh if your if your google dorks are good enough you can find repositories of all kinds of interesting data on the internet. Um, yeah. So this is yeah, nice, uh, nice uh, OSN drop right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is um, uh, I am for I am again. I, I don't know if the rules say only one per, but we'll go for it. Uh, do you think that if a government is first to develop a quantum computer, they'll crack Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency encryption? I don't buy the argument that someone will use a quantum computer and make a better encryption and stay ahead of the governments. I'm, am I wrong with his assumptions? I'm not sure that an individual- I think we're fundamentally limited in quantum computers. I think a lot of what we think they can do is based on our misunderstandings of quantum mechanics. We, we don't understand quantum gravity and we're trying to build a machine out of those parts. Mm. Like, I think, I think we, we are going to hit a wall in the same way we hit a wall with machine learning in uh, the 50s. Mm. They were like, they were the, all of the cyberneticists, the smart people invented the algorithms we still use today, right? They're yeah. saying like 10 years, human brain. That period, and I will reference my previous post here that I skipped, but if you haven't read Cryptonomicon, um, that period that I am for I am that you're talking about and the, when this when the Enigma machine was relevant and things like that is that is a work of fiction, but it is mm -hmm. fascinating. It is mm -hmm. damn fascinating Agreed. To talk about this stuff and it talks about a lot of this stuff that, that is in the question here. But basically, the question is. Uh, it's going to be a government or the NSA or the military first. It's not going to be like an individual who, like Tesla, is not going to invent it in his garage. Kind of be a DAO. It could be a DAO. Could be a DAO. Could be a DAO. There's quantum computers that exist. I guess the question is like Bitcoin crack cracking uh, quantum, that kind of thing. You think I that'll think be? It's, a I don't think that's a, a risk. I I really don't think like so. For instance, uh, there was a big to do a few years ago about. Um, uh, a Chinese satellite that successfully communicated using uh, entangled particles, uh, yeah. non-entangled, non non-local particles, to be clear. Um, way, what man. they did not tell us <laughs> was that all they were able to verify was that a message was sent and received. The content is lost. There's okay. no way to there's no way to preserve information yet because we don't know how. So it's uh, like and, and basically the dumb experiment doesn't work. Huh. I didn't see, I didn't read further into it. I just was thinking, wow, that's a long, cause that was a, I was thinking that was a gargantuan leap because if you, we're talking about centimeters and then feet at the most. And then they were like, Oh, satellites. It was a material science win, right? They were able to keep it contained while they launched it into orbit. But. Hmm. Do you think, um, do you think there's a danger of, of Bitcoin being hit by a quantum machine? Do you think there's a government that wants to kill Bitcoin badly enough to do no. that? Uh, I don't. I, I don't think there is. And I don't think that that machine is, at this point, I'm not even sure. I think the machine that we think we can build with quantum computers is uh, as useful as we expect it to be. I think that, that some of the things we attribute to the limitations of physics are actually our misunderstandings of 
uh, what parts of our understanding of quantum mechanics have to do with the way our brains perceive. Um, like we, we may be imagining a lot of time. Like I, I don't think time is uh, a useful dimension to reason in except for human beings. Like it's, um, it's how we deal with uh, having to elide a bunch of detail. You know, if we're looking at a couple of quantum particles, time goes away, but we can't accept that. Right. So it's kind of like because if we accept that, then there's no way to time a computer op or a, set, a series of computer operation. It's kind of like how we have to order our operations as if we were a Windows 95 machine. Right. Before we might was. do right. We might do quantum computing. We might have a really fast chip, but the bus is never going to be faster than we can build in non-quantum space. Hmm. Well, that's definitely more than I know about that. I'll have to look into. But assuming it's possible. Um, do you think that there is incentive for governments to do that? Or is it at this point, um, do you think that the algorithm will be switched fast enough when by the time that becomes a danger? Assuming once again that it is possible, let's, let's say that it's like, okay, you get this many qubits and then, you know, SHA-256 is dead, right? There's, there's a pretty good chance that it's too yeah. genie out of the bottle to do anything about it at that point. Could you... Um, if they could get there, I don't think I think they would be too late to do anything in a way that would be um, that would be advisable. I think mean, it would tear apart society to do it at that point. Well, which is you know, and and some people think that's exactly what's happening, right? Yeah, I mean, and I I never want to attribute malice to anybody who works in government because I've seen what happens. Like I used to work for Indiana legislature, and those people were really committed to doing a good job for the people they served. Uh, especially the people who were non-political appointments, the life uh, workers um, did things like actively go out of their way to consider both sides of uh, political divides because they're supposed to be nonpartisan and um, stuff like that. Like they're really trying hard. It's just that bureaucracy systems kind of, you know, always end up doing the wrong thing with good intentions. Right on. I want to, we're, um, we're at time. But these are these, there's there's only two more questions left, and I uh, I well, don't let's, know. Let's get them. Yeah. Okay. Let's get them. I do and, have to jump off the call pretty quick after this though, because yeah. Uh, so let's do a lightning round. Let's bring that back for a minute and do lightning yeah. round. Is the metaverse truly a new concept in pop culture? This is from Bitcoin Johnny, or is it just video game avatars advertised to pop culture and the masses? I would say, um, uh, good question. Like, do you consider Second Life or World of Warcraft a metaverse? Because that is a you know, it's a bunch of people in one little universe. It isn't on blockchain, but does that matter? You know? Yeah. Uh, my question, I guess my answer to that question is a question, but that's what I'm doing. So your turn. <laughs> I think the answer is we've been building, uh, we've been building this thing, whatever the hell it is, uh, for a lot longer than we've had names for most of it. You know, you go back 10 years, some of the words don't make sense. You go back 20 years, almost none of them do. You go back a thousand years and bring that person forward and show what we got today. They literally die of shock. But they were it. building it because they figured out how to how to get fire into a pit. Yeah, you, you know, imagine, like a phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been building the metaverse, and we don't know what the next thing is, but yeah. uh, but we're building it too. It's not a new concept in pop culture, um, or maybe, maybe I would say it's a new new in pop culture, but that's a sign of its ascendancy, not a sign of its newness. I think it's kind of like dubstep where dubstep was around for a long time before 2012. <laughs> yeah. dubstep brought it up, dug it up to the masses and everybody ate it up. Right. right. And so, when it went away, some people li like me kept listening to it. Yeah. I'll, I'll still listen to uh, uh, Scary Monsters and Nice Bright. Great trip hop band I found out about today, by the way, which because um, the uh, a track by this woman was in um, uh, or this band was in um, the preview for the new Daisy uh, okay. update which is like actually kind of one of those games that's very metaversy, right? Mm -hmm. What are um, they called? Uh, they are called, uh, oh, it's um, something field. It's a uh, narcotic field. Narcotic field. Oh, yeah, I know field. the OG trip hopper, but... Uh, it's, um, the singer right. is gifted, man. Like in the same way that the Portis Head singer was, was, was uh, perceived. You, you'll wow. like it if you like trip hop. So next, la next and last, Earth Dragon, uh, will augmented reality be what brings the metaverse and pop culture together? Yes, uh, and, I'd say. You said what? I'd say yes and. Um, yeah, yes and. Um, it's plus uh, money. 
<laughs> you know, if there's money in it, it'll be brought to pop culture. Yeah. This actually comes back to a point I wanted to bring up earlier. So it's a good way to go sort of to the end of it. Cause okay. like what we're doing right now is building machines that build consensus and then decide. I think the real leap forward is going to be govern our societies as human beings by consensus with one another. Uh, I and, think that, and, and refusing to govern against each other with force, but rather only by consensus. Yeah, that's that's sort of what, you know, that, that's that's the concept I'm trying to prove with my company a little bit. You know, it's um, I think you're right now. Uh, yeah, it's it's something that is an experiment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, and I was drawn to this whole experiment because I think in part, even though it wasn't explicitly stated at the time, like that was the vibe I was getting. So, um, right it's almost an unspoken way that I think I may pick projects more than I know, but. So, um, yeah, we're at time. This was, that was a lot of really good questions. Thanks everyone. Yeah. And, and thanks for, thanks for hanging in there with me, Dave. I know I can fly off the handle in your direction sometimes. So That's all right. I have, to, I have to hold myself back too. Um, let's do a couple of plugs, uh, because I have to hold myself back on the coffee show sometimes because I, yesterday we went for two and a half hours, you know, and we usually go for at least two hours. And it's just because I'm the same kind of way. I just start talking about stuff. And if I have somebody else in the room that wants to talk, buddy, we'll talk. <laughs> we'll go yeah. for however long we feel like going, you know? Um, but yeah, so um, I'll just say uh, my show on Wednesday is Coffee with Den. And it's kind of the perfect morning coffee show for me because we can talk about anything as long as it's on Den. And mm -hmm. as, soon as, you, as soon as you ask a question that replies to that post, it's on Den, isn't it? So it's basically an anything goes uh, kind of kind of show. Mm -hmm. um, that's Wednesday mornings. And then um, just check out, keep an eye on DIN uh, this year. There's, you know, I'm not going to give any timelines and I'm not going to give any, any, uh, anything away right now, but yeah. um, I, I've got butterflies in my stomach. I, I desperately you know want the mobile app on iOS to be able to create governance issues. I don't know if anybody else wants that, but I really do. Oh, did iOS not have that? You should be not able yet. to. Okay. At least my version of it. I might need to. I might need to reboot it or something. There is an update coming out uh, today or tomorrow, cool. so that'll that'll include. Um, we just updated our chat rooms. Each each community has its own chat, um, and what we've done is very interesting. We have put so we have the layer itself, which is you put posts in there, just like you would expect any other platform that has posts, but then the chat. Um, now, instead of just having chat from people that are in that layer, whenever someone posts in the layer, it actually comes in line in the chat as a message and you can like reply from it in there and everything. So yeah. really, if you're somebody who likes to earn, uh, cryptocurrency by evaluating content on DIN, right? Mm -hmm. Evaluating other people's posts, which is a paid role. Mm -hmm. Um, you can, you can up your rewards game by hanging out in chat. And then you'll be the first to know when something hits because it comes in sort of in real time. So awesome. the chat, yeah, for evaluators on the platform, I feel like chat rooms just got a major upgrade for them because now that's like the most profitable place to hang out. Mm -hmm. It's because the first person to vote on these things, if they're correct, if they don't just throw a vote in that ends up being wrong, then they right. get paid out more than somebody who came later. So oh, yeah. that's well, I mean, and I've got to say too, like just from a just from an aesthetic standpoint, um, you know, Den has has uh, captured my uh, my favorite status from what cool. the kind of work you guys are doing on it. The awesome. the visual appeal of it is way better than uh, apps that have had a lot longer to try. So, We're finally getting DMs. That's what's being worked on right now. So that's what's coming next. That's what I want to say to the yes. That's so awesome, man. I know that you've got Cardinal out, and uh, I know yeah. that you're working on uh, adding some functionality to that uh, as well. Not not oh. functionality. You're adding a a couple of other features, but what's yep. going on? Tell us about we. Um, so some of the things that we're working on, and I can't promise any launch dates because I will get strangled. But um, but we are working on uh, new chains as we as we discussed before. We're working on a slight refactor of Flume that will make it more robust to um, to some really neat features that we couldn't give to people broadly before that we're going to be able to. And I can't say anything more than that. Uh, like experiments that we've done that if we took them to scale would not have worked will work. Um, and, and the last thing I would say is a new, then I, I can say this is coming soon and we're super excited about it, a new user experience for, for everybody who's actually using the dashboard site. Like we've, we've got a guy who's brilliant uh, 
uh, Jesse Ako. Um, you should check him out on Twitter if you get a chance. But like, uh, he has built something that in first draft is is just it's 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 artful. So I'm excited to share some of that stuff with people and get it out there. I'll stay tuned in for sure. Well, thanks. Um, I want to just say, uh, if you haven't already, join the WBRT layer on DIN to ask questions for next week's WBRT. Next next week's roundtable's theme is a freestyle. So um, that'll be great. And we can do more of what we do best, which is go on about topics we're passionate about, right? So freestyle. Don't forget to maybe golem me if you want to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, share this episode. Because the more you share it, the more a lot of hosts uh, and topic contributors will get. Uh, and then we announce how many uh, how many they get next week after those results are in. Like, comment, and subscribe. And um, thank you once again uh, for tuning in and asking questions and being here with us. And um, we'll see you again next week. Thanks again, Greg. And thanks to everyone out there. Bye-bye. All capital, label radical, yet rational Adaptable approach is palpable If this animal is fallible But that conclusion is laughable So if we're all detachable From the mandible You see it now?